Well, good morning, everyone. Very difficult to follow Dame Stella, but we will endeavor to make our conversation as interesting as her enlightening conversation this morning. My name is Jason Oxman. I'm the president and CEO of ITI, the trade association, the technology industry. We're here at Cybos celebrating the intersection of financial services and technology, two industries that once were very distinct and now have converged. Anyone who's had a chance to walk the show floor here at Cybos knows that financial services companies and technology companies are partnering together to address two very disparate things. One, the need to provide the fastest possible service to customers who demand near real-time access to funds. And two, the desire to protect customers from fraud and cybercrime. You all know that the initial services designed in the 1970s around the electronic transfer of money actually had time built in to provide time for fraud checks. And it was a matter of days. The original ACH network settlement process of three days was designed to give enough time for an analysis to prevent fraud, to address crime, and to reverse transactions as necessary. Now, of course, today, modern financial services need to be real time. So how do we address the growing cyber threat when the time isn't there that's necessary to address it before the transaction closes. Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about the intersection of financial services and technology with an expert panel of people who have worked across financial services, uh, across cyber crime, and can provide you some real actionable intelligence about the threats that we face today, and more importantly, technology solutions to address them. Let me introduce our expert panel to you, and then we're gonna have a interactive dialogue that I promise you will be both interesting and useful. Immediately to my left, um, please welcome uh, Sir Rob Wainwright. Uh, Sir Rob is uh, at Deloitte. He's a partner in Deloitte uh, within the cyber and financial crime practice. Uh, he also served for nine years as the director of Interpol uh, and actually introduced into Interpol the European Counterterrorism Center and the European uh, Cyber Crime Office. Uh, Hello, Sean. Hello. Oh, did you notice I'm using a Microsoft Surface tablet? Very good. Yes, that was not intentional, <laughs> I promise. Um, Sean John, uh, MBE, is from Microsoft. Um, she's director of EMEA and the Asia Pacific uh, region for cybersecurity strategy for Microsoft's cybersecurity solutions group. Um, she leads a team, a team of uh, strategy advisors uh, who work with Microsoft customers uh, to help adapt uh, and deploy technology to address cybercrime. Um, next to uh, Xion is J.F. Legault, who is Managing Director, Global Head of Cybersecurity Operations for J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Um, as Head of uh, Cybersecurity Operations, uh, J.F. is responsible for the Cybersecurity Operations Centers that J.P. Morgan Chase operates globally. Uh, welcome, J.F. And uh, all the way on the end, um, Sherry McGuire is the uh, Group Chief Information Security Officer for Standard Chartered, one of the largest banks in the world. Um, and Sherry, in that capacity, is responsible for uh, cybersecurity for the bank. She brings 30 years of experience to that role, having worked both in government in the US for the Department of Homeland Security uh, and technology companies, including Microsoft. So welcome to our panelists. And uh, Sir Rob, we're going to start uh, with you. To give us an overview, because you've operated at the intersection of uh, law enforcement, uh, cybercrime, and now uh, helping financial institutions and technology companies uh, address the threat. So let's start with a broad overview of the threat landscape. Uh, what are we uh, looking at out there when we look at uh, cybercrime challenges to financial institutions today? Yeah, thanks, Jason. As I work today uh, with uh, many of our clients uh, in the financial space, and compare that to the work I was at Europol, by the way, not Interpol. But, I'm sorry, uh, I said Interpol. Uh, not many people have, have made that um, uh, same confusion. Listen, I, I think in many respects, the threat landscape hasn't changed that much uh, in the sense that cyber criminals are still using traditional malware uh, to uh, reutilizing those tools to steal as much personal data, banking credentials, and other forms of data as possible dump it on the dark marketplaces for onward sale for the use of fraud. And so the illegal acquisition exploitation of personal data is still what's driving the bulk end of the cyber criminal economy. What has changed in the last um, two years, though, noticeably, is at the top end of this economy, 
uh, we've seen the emergence of a much more aggressive strain um, of attackers, uh, higher end capability, the combination of bespoke malware, advanced social engineering, for example, to directly target bank transfer payment systems and the networks of, indeed, other industries as well. Uh, famously, and, and, and the work that we spent, uh, worked at Europol on the most aggressive cyber criminal network for some time, the so-called Carbonac Gang, stole $1.2 billion from 100 financial institutions uh, in a very specific, targeted way. And that's at the top end, which makes it very, very challenging, I think, uh, even for uh, you know, the most global and advanced banks to, to deal with that. And what, of course, compounds that challenge for all of us is the fact that we're operating in an ever more digitally connected ecosystem where we're exposing ourselves to greater points of vulnerability simply because we're doing greater business on a global level through complex supply chains, for example. So, you know, it is becoming more challenging um, and, and raises, you know, different questions about how we should respond. Sean, let's uh, talk about Microsoft's perspective on the landscape as well. What are uh, some of the cybercrime issues that you're helping your customers uh, address? I think pretty much the same ones that uh, Robin was just coming there, but it really is the fact that cybercrime is now becoming much more mainstream. It was every single part of organization. So there is that top end with the high sophistication taking money out and the fact that so much of what we do now digitally leads to you know, financial loss, that there's a real motivation to go after it. But then there's also that large mainstream noise of, of general cybercrime that's also in there as well. So from a, a, our customer's point of view, it's like, how do I deal with it? It's sophisticated, but how do I actually also deal with that broad noise as well, all while enabling the organizations they're helping to secure to go through the sort of digital transformation that's really happening at the moment? Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about what the architecture looks like for a global financial institution like, uh, like J.P. Morgan Chase? You have global oversight of these centers. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to tell us where they are, but at least if you can give us an overview of how that architecture is set up and, and how it's changed in recent years to address the current threat landscape. Yeah, picking up on what's been said, right, our, our focus is understanding adversary, understanding the motivations of the threat actors, and then really taking a look at uh, likelihood, intent, capability of these different adversaries to see how they could target financial institutions, ourselves, others, utilities, partners. And, and what we do there is then monitor for that activity. So in our cybersecurity operations in New York, London, and Singapore, follow the Sun model, 24-7 coverage capability, we have analysts that are heavily focused on understanding the adversary, while others are heavily focused on the monitoring aspects. And we do that, as I mentioned, by understanding the capabilities, the intent, and then being able to understand the attack vectors that these different adversaries use. So targeted malware, very specific, uh, social engineering, or just some that have lesser sophistication commodity malware, and then develop content that allows us to detect that activity and then respond to it once observed. And I think what's important to call out here is historically, organizations have taken a stance where once they feel protected, they don't investigate what's been blocked. And I think it becomes more and more important to investigate even the activity that's been blocked or prevented because sophisticated adversaries won't reveal early on in their activity their most sophisticated tools. They'll start with commodity malware, they'll start with commodity techniques, and then escalate as needed. So the early detection component comes from being able to identify all sorts of activity targeting the organization. And Sherry, from Standard Chartered's perspective, uh, one of the challenges I can imagine with identifying those threats is that you have a lot of partners out there. We're in an open banking environment uh, today, uh, which is fairly new, and I know there's a lot of partnership activity taking place here uh, between banks and, and non-bank uh, technology companies in many cases. How does that open banking environment change the way in which you're looking at threats and the way in which you're able to respond to them? Well, certainly it adds a lot of new complexity into all of our organizations, how we're actually interfacing with each other and adopting new technologies. That creates both opportunities and on the security side, a lot of new challenges. In 
interestingly enough, the API issue, which is quite, uh, we all talk about APIs today, right? Uh, application uh, programming in interfaces around how we're connecting all of these new technologies, how we're connecting to the cloud, how we're connecting to partners. Those are still susceptible to all of the same threats and types of attacks that you've heard the other panelists talk about. And so it's really even more critical that we make sure that we have proper configurations and that those APIs are as rock solid as we can possibly make them. That creates an opportunity for us as financial institutions as well as other tech providers, the FinTech community and so forth to really make sure that we have the right protocols and standards in place and that we're adopting those to build security in and build privacy in as we're adopting all of those APIs. JF, I want to actually come back to you on this as well, because Chase obviously has a lot of partners. Uh, on the issuing side, you have uh, a lot of co-brands out there, data moving back and forth uh, among partners. On the acquiring side, obviously, you're one of the largest acquiring institutions in the, in the world. Uh, so you have merchant partners and exchanging data back and forth there. And then there are plenty of apps that I have on my phone that mm -hmm. interface with Chase that aren't operated by Chase. So how does your analysis of the threat landscape change based on what Sherry was talking about, these APIs, in some cases they're mandated by regulators, in some cases they're just voluntary partnerships. How do you maintain your secure environment when you have all these third party partners uh, with access to your systems as well? It, it comes down to understanding the threat landscape, right? So understanding who's targeting us, who's targeting our partners, and, and having the right people that are part of our team. So early on, as you, know, you look at the uptick in wholesale payment attacks in 2016, one of the first steps that we did is we went to our business partners, the people that operate payments in the bank, and we said, do you have anybody on your teams that are looking for a new job, that are looking for a new challenge? We want to hire them. We said the same thing to our retail bank teams, and we said, we're going to bring them in to our intelligence team in cyber, and have them bring us the knowledge of the business. And that's the first step. It's really understanding the business. The second part is really building out the threat models. Right? As we look at this evolution, right, you can have a solid understanding of the threat landscape, but what specific adversaries are interested in what you're developing? So depending on the industry, depending on the platforms, there's different adversaries that have interest. Then it's understanding their tactics and their techniques. So how do they achieve their objectives? How are they going to target you as an organization, right? So if it's an API uh, gateway, well, what are some of the techniques that they might employ to be able to compromise that gateway? Is it stealing credentials? Is it stealing keys that allow them to authenticate against that API? So you build out these tactics and techniques, and then you, you look at the likelihood of each of these, right? You prioritize them. And then you go and map that against your existing controls. So what controls do I have in my environment, right? So if you look at wholesale payments, there's Swift CSP that lists out a series of controls. But if you're in other areas, you'll look at this uh, clear series of controls that are in your catalog, and then you'll make a determination. Do I have the appropriate controls to offset these tactics, techniques, these attack vectors that the adversary use? And then you go and define new controls as needed, the control objectives, the control outcomes. And, and I think what's becoming more and more important is how do you measure the outcome of that control? So have the, have the appropriate uh, performance indicators and risk indicators based on your threat landscape to demonstrate that this new area, this evolution of technology has the right controls in place to your business partners, right? I'm accountable both to the CIO, but I'm very accountable to our business to protect it day to day. Mm -hmm. And Sean, you, you actually spend a lot of time doing that as well, training yeah. the trainers, if you will, training people on how to recognize these threats and how to deal with them. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you, uh, how you undertake that task so in I'll this say partnership what, I'll environment? Say what, one of the challenges we see, first of all, is that there's very different levels of maturity of organizations, but most financial services organizations are very mature in their security control framework. Uh, and some are doing exactly what you're saying, where they're re-evaluating the controls and looking for new controls. What we quite often see is people trying to use the controls they've had in place for maybe 15, 20 years and take that new way of working and, and route it through 
their existing control frameworks. We see that a lot as people adopt things like open banking, but cloud and, and mobile workforce. It, there's still a the sort of traditional castle and moat mentality quite often in a lot of security teams where it's how do I pull it into my existing on-premise perimeter environment, which really isn't consistent with what people are trying to do in some of the new ways of working in financial services with this more openness, with more sharing and more control. So one of the biggest conversations we have is, so you've got that control that's designed for that outcome. Have you got the appropriate control? Does it work? Or do you actually need to look for a new control, for a new way of working on it? How do you do that in the new world? And it will vary from organization we talk to. And I'd say financial services is one of the, the biggest places where we see this issue because they are more mature than other industries is that you'll see many, many organizations that get on board and do exactly what Jeff was talking about, but then you see others where it's like, but I know my current environment, I understand my current environment, and now I've got to do this new way of working, but I've got high skill in the old sort of legacy way of working and low skill in the new way. So I think that bringing in people from around the organization is one of the things we talk about. And I think it's a thing as an industry in cybersecurity we need to do more where we become connected to the business and we bring people from the businesses and expertise and help them. I think that's the biggest challenge I see day to day is quite often, and it's, uh, breaking is probably too strong a word, but stressing the new ways of working by trying to make them fit into old security frameworks. Sure, you had something you want to add? Yeah, I wanted to just um, bring up, I think really at the root of what we're talking about here is how we're evaluating our third-party security risk. And traditionally, we've looked at that in very static environment. One time, annually, biannually, depending on the risk level of the partner, the type of data that we're looking at. But what I think we're really talking about now is not only just understanding the threat landscape and doing the assessments around the controls that we need to put in place, but expanding that view into third-party security risk assessments. We're all bound by those as financial institutions under various regulatory regimes. But how far do they really go? Are they a checkbox? Are they a point in time? Are they very audit approached? Or do they include real-time threat intelligence feedback? Do you have a full understanding of, uh, are you monitoring the specific nodes, the APIs, the interconnections? Are you collecting data from both your partners and yourselves? Do you have regular interface and catch up with the partners so that you understand what's happening in their environment and what that risk could be that's being introduced back into your organization? So this is really, I think, uh, we're all looking at how we evolve that third party security risk approach because it really does be move beyond just third party, now it's fourth party and fifth party. I have to say also, Jason, as a, you know, as a security professional for many years, it's very encouraging that we have on here now two banks that are talking you know, in quite mature ways about the importance of being led by, by threat intelligence. And that hasn't always been the case in, 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 in this sector. And uh, we're now moving to a position where we're trying to consciously understand the threat in a much better way. Now, that's important because of the gravity and complexity of, of the threat. It takes us to a position, therefore, where the sharing of intelligence as well between banks across the sector with law enforcement in a more systematic, instituted way is a really important part of the future going forward. And, and we're just taking some baby steps towards that in the community right now, but I'm encouraged at least that we have two good examples of what's happening inside some global banks. Indeed, and let me stay with you for a second and ask you about that threat. I can imagine that the threat that banks are facing today is very different than the threat they were facing even uh, a, a few years ago. Um, we're looking at very sophisticated criminal enterprises. In many cases, we're looking at state-sponsored criminal enterprises um, that are endeavoring to um, take advantage of, uh, of weakness in, in, in systems uh, and exploit them. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the threat landscape changes when there are potentially state actors involved or state-sponsored actors? We've seen that in a lot of breach activity. Um, is that something you're seeing more of, and does that pose a unique challenge to how to address it? Yeah, that's a good point, and I think it's part, that's a notable feature of this you know, higher-end capability that occupies the top end of the cyber criminal economy. Um, you know, the, the bigger emergence, bigger footprint now of, of the activities of malicious state actors. You know, in the past, for many years, of course, uh, malicious state actors have used technology to target uh, their adversaries, but traditionally along quite a narrow attack vector aimed at government, military inst installations, 
just in the last three or four years, they've broadened, and, and the impact on commerce more broadly is noticeably greater. And so we have state actors that are in the business of stealing money, frankly, others that are using high-end capability to steal the commercial secrets of commercial organizations. And that's a big problem for many industries right now. And others that are engaging in spreading out into the wild, you know, destructive malware of the type that we saw in the now famous non petty incident a couple of years ago, you know, which was trained on, on, on the government infrastructure of a certain country, but which many, many global companies picked up by accident. That's the point. Because we're operating in this interconnected digital ecosystem, a company that wasn't in the firing line at all still almost got wiped by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So it's adding to this sense of you know, systemic uh, danger, I think, in, in, in the community and adding to the growing need why we have to use smarter threat intelligence capability to drive our response. Mm -hmm. Can I ask our bank friends, JF, uh, Sherry, is that uh, without talking about any specific cases or specific countries, uh, are you seeing an increase in that, that threat posed by state actors, whereas a number of years ago it was individual criminals uh, that you were more worried about? It's an evolution, and, and you know, I, I treat threat, threat actors as, as a supply chain, right? And we're seeing a lot of threat actors that are heavily focused on malware development, so they're, they're really working as contractors, which makes work sometimes on attribution a lot more difficult because a nation state actor might outsource part of the work for laundering of funds or development of malware to a criminal group, right? So we're seeing these different partnerships, whereas a few years ago you had criminal actors on one side and nation state actors on the other. They're working together now, right? Depending on you know, the competitive advantage that each of them have, it's really a value-add supply chain, as I said. And getting to understand that is uh, very interesting because you know if, if you take a threat actor who doesn't have you know language capabilities in a certain country, but they want to target that country, they might partner with a criminal actor that has that knowledge, that language skill for developing phishing schemes or interacting with the users on chat in that language. So you're seeing this meshing of the actors. And, and when you go back to understanding you know, attribution, and, and attribution becomes important to understand motivation, uh, you need to get that full spectrum view. The analogy I sometimes use is when you're authenticating a painting, right? So you're taking a painting from a grandmaster, you're gonna look at the frame, you're gonna look at the paint, you're gonna look at the brush stroke. Well, we do a lot of the same things when we're doing attributions of an adversary. We're looking at the malicious code, we're looking at their TTPs, their uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that they employ to be able to map to that adversary because in the end, what you want to understand is part of the motivation to understand the intent and the capability of that adversary and what they intend to do with that data. If you look at some breaches, at times, the, the data from a breach will end up on the criminal underground, and there's other breaches where the data never makes it to the criminal underground, so you imagine that a nation state actor might be behind that with very specific motivations for enrichment, economic purposes, or understanding movement of people or you know, family relationships. I would just add that um, the lines between different types of attackers are quite blurred today. Uh, so as you mentioned, the, the outsourcing, if you will, to different uh, organized crime groups or individual hackers or um, other types of entities, it's quite blurred. So I tend to focus, I mean, the attribution piece is important, absolutely, because it is, it is the way that we will ultimately deter cybercrime by being able to identify who the attackers are and bring them to justice. However, the studies have repeatedly shown, and certainly many of the breaches that we've seen over the last several years have targeted, they've not necessarily been very sophisticated attacks. They've targeted basic security controls and foundational elements that we are all expected to implement. And so if we can prevent 85 to 90% of breaches 
by addressing foundational controls around good vulnerability management, security logging and monitoring, strong authentication and identity management, and a few others. <laughs> if we can do that and get that right, we can actually prevent a lot of the cases that we see today and make the entire ecosystem a lot more secure. John? Yeah, that's something I would definitely back up. It's something we see a lot is uh, with some of the customers we deal with, some very in-depth in conversations about how to protect against really advanced security attacks in their environment, and yet a very, very low percentage of customers have enabled multi-factor authentication, even on their admin accounts, on the accounts who actually have the rights to change things and can materially steal things, they haven't even got an extra level of multi-factor authentication, and, and to my mind, that just means that you're relying on people using their dog's name as the password or some variant of that, ultimately, because the, the level of ingenuity an individual will go to put their dog's name into a password with a strong password requirement is amazing. And so but you, you see a lot of people will spend a lot of time challenging us around very, very sophisticated ways of, of how people could break into maybe the cloud or something like that, and that's valid to do. That's why we've just released things like the CSP standards for, for Azure to allow you to build a secure environment in Azure. That's viable. But if you're going to spend the time doing that, also put in proper threat and vulnerability management, put in, yeah, I think it's like 90% of all attacks would be stopped by enabling multi-factor authentication. And yet, I think it's about 3% of our customers that have it enabled. So I that's, shouldn't be using my dog's name? You shouldn't be using your dog's name. <laughs> oh, really? Well, it still works. Yeah, like, phishing phishing is still one of the main yeah. vectors. And to your Sorry. point about the basic hygiene, you look at phishing and people still repeatedly continue to it, click on links. Because it is social engineering. Yes. So it is literally, yeah, one thing we are seeing getting more sophisticated is the phishing. Yeah. Because that whole uh, model of people being able to connect together is it's no longer, the, you know, the, 20, the, the image of an as a hacker is a 22-year-old, I'm afraid to say man, who hasn't got any friends sitting in a bedroom creating mass malware. That's not who they are, or if they are, they're one of these outsourced contractors creating the software. The people that are writing phishing attacks understand social engineering, understand people, going back to what Stella was talking about earlier on, about how it's to understand how to manipulate and engage with people. That's what we're dealing with now. So phishing will always succeed. Obviously, companies like ourselves put more and more technology in to block as much as we can. But if you get a really, really highly targeted phishing attack, it, it, we can't guarantee we're going to stop everything. And you try and stop people clicking on it. And if they do, you try and minimize it. But you've got to have the extra level of control. So if they click on it, 90%, I think, of attacks start with some sort of a phishing attack. If you have things like multi-factor authentication, like logging and monitoring, like those controls, then you can limit that very, very small percentage where they will click on it. Everybody in every organization has one person who will click on absolutely anything. <laughs> no matter what you do, they will click on it. So you can, you can train people to the nth degree. You've always got, we have this thing in cybersecurity, we talk about all the controls in the red corner and Dave in the blue corner. Every organization's got a Dave. And you've got to cope with the fact of how do I, how do I respond when Dave does Dave's thing? Well, and sometimes Dave is not an employee of the organization. Yeah. Back to Sherry's point earlier about the APIs and the partners out there. You know, the largest retail breach in the United States in recent years was of Target, and it wasn't a Target employee who was breached. It was the air conditioning contractor who had access into the systems uh, to monitor the temperature in Target stores and hadn't reset the default password, and that's how they got in. So how do you... How do you manage the, the third parties and the, um, the vendors and the, the supposed trusted partners? Uh, how do you train them? How do you keep them in that mindset as well? well one, of the, one of the things that we've been doing at Standard Chartered is through our correspondent banking academy over the last several years, uh, we have a specific track specifically around information and cybersecurity risk. It's really about the evolution of both educating and training our business partners on the business side, not solely on the technology side, right? Cybersecurity is a business risk, just like market risk and capital risk and all the other risks that we deal with from a principal risk type perspective in, in financial institutions. And so by starting to evolve that conversation to really focus on, as a business owner, do you understand 
what is your current state of multi-factor authentication or database encryption or your API security or your third-party security risk? Do you really understand the current metrics that you have around those within your organization? Do you know the right set of questions to ask? And I, 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 would, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a, um, a recent guide uh, that was produced by uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in partnership with SWIFT, the IMF, and the Financial Services ISAC, and Standard Chartered as a partner as well, that we released specifically as a capacity building toolbox for smaller institutions to give them guidelines and checklists and, and some real foundational elements around what are the kinds of things that they should be looking and asking about business risk within their smaller organization. It's been translated into six other languages in addition to English. But I think that's, a, you know, those are the kinds of, I think, things that we can take lessons learned that we've had both from technology and, and organizations like SWIFT and, and other financial institutions to really share some of those lessons learned with our, our other correspondent banks and, and other partners on the kinds of things that they should be looking for. And I think these are all, these are all very helpful me measures being shown to work. But as Sean said, you know, there will always be a Dave in the end. Um, and it's just an environmental hazard, of course, and then that hazard becomes more complex the more globalized and interconnected uh, we are, of course. I think this is partly a culture, you know, introducing uh, the principle of security um, to be adopted, more ingrained as part of our working culture uh, in our community. That's somewhat been missing until now, maybe. So as you do that, as you lead from the top in the way in which you behave, as you integrate into the design process of your process, your procedure towards digital banking, a more conceptual understanding, more ingrained understanding of security, and the culture begins to change, and that helps. But in the end, there will always be a day. So you're left with the idea that, you know, what is important systemic resilience, that you are likely to get caught sometime, somehow. You've got to be ready for that when it happens. And so it's a, it's a different mindset, I think, Jason, around understanding what you need to do when the day, probably inevitable, when the day comes that you will be hit. Can we talk a little bit about the role of law enforcement and partnership and information sharing and, and calling on your intelligence background and, uh, you know, uh, Sherry mentioned the uh, FSISAC, which is a, an organization, information sharing. Uh, but of course, there are restrictions on the ability of banks to share information on threats with each other. There are sometimes even restrictions on the ability of banks to share information with the government. Um, and of course, it moves in the other direction as well. Sometimes government isn't in a position to be able to share threat intelligence because of an ongoing investigation or a risk that something will be interrupted. How, how are we doing as an industry in financial services in um, sharing information with, with law enforcement? How is law enforcement doing in partnership with industry in uh, making sure that's a two-way sharing of information? What are some things you'd like to see done a little bit better? What is, what's some advice you provide to, to your partners and clients about uh, how to interface with law enforcement to address these threats? Yeah, I don't think the industry is doing well enough, frankly. I think we, we do have some, some examples. I think because of those restrictions and a number of others, you know, they're, they're relatively immature um, public-private information sharing examples, certainly compared to my experience, you know, at Europol where we brought a thousand law enforcement actors onto one platform. You know, that was a very considerable uh, industrial level exchange that, that completely powered our ability to deal uh, with high-end criminality and terrorism, for example. And I'd like to see something of that order in what is at least as urgent a problem in this sector, for example. So. The fact that I think regulators inadvertently have not created the right uh, framework to allow that to happen says something also about the lack of culture. The fact that, for example, data privacy, banking secrecy um, have seemingly been put in front of, of security as, as an operating principle. I think that needs to change. There has to be a better balance. And I think we need to create the kind of industry platforms uh, also on financial crime, just as importantly, in a way we haven't seen yet. So that's about industry leadership, I think, Jason, also. I think it's about some of our banking leaders and our law enforcement chiefs, supported by regulators, creating just a new architecture of cooperation and, and something that uh, you know, I and my, my colleagues at Deloitte are working urgently on at the moment, because I think there are many opportunities to get this right. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, there's some really good examples out there. Certainly FSISAC, the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis, is the, the uh, analysis center, is the uh, 
perhaps the longest standing uh, entity that all, all of us are, are members of. But there's also other efforts that have been underway that have started in the last several years. So one uh, very successful uh, effort is the Cyber Defense Alliance that was started here in the UK by a, a number of banks, uh, Standard Chartered, Barclays, uh, Santander, uh, Lloyds is a member, Deutsche, and a few uh, other banks, including some Irish banks, really focused on specifically building, sharing information, building cases, and then being able to share those with law enforcement entities, the appropriate law enforcement entities, who then take that information and use it to investigate and prosecute criminals. To date, we have over 19 arrests that we can point to. Now, that may seem like a, long, a, a very small number, but the organization's only been in existence for a couple of years, so we've been building that capability. I think that there are absolutely restrictions around what types of information we can share. We've got to make sure we're abiding by banking secrecy acts and uh, uh, abiding by various privacy uh, requirements. But there is some misnomer, I think, in the community about the level of sharing and what we can actually share. GDPR in particular is often held up as, nope, we can't share because of GDPR. GDPR was written with a specific exemption that you may share if it is a cyber intelligence, cyber threat information for the intent purpose of protecting your organization or the broader ecosystem. So I think it's important that we you know, dispel some of the myths out there too. Mm -hmm. If I may say, it's a, it's a great point because often privacy legislation is generally mis misinterpreted as this great long lockdown instrument. You know, we had a very strong, robust data privacy regime uh, imposed on us in law enforcement, and we still managed to connect 1,000 agencies across 40 countries. And we did that because providing you, you're absolutely crystal clear about what your purpose is, and, and you stay within the boundaries of pr proportionality in collecting only that data you need for the specific purpose, privacy legislation is here to help you. And I absolutely agree with Sherry that GDPR can allow you to do that. So we just need to be slightly more positive about what, what privacy legislation allows us to do. It, is, it, it, it is, doesn't lock down our game. In many respects, it might open up new opportunities. I mean, from our perspective, we respond to the threats. And then if it goes to you know, pursuing uh, a criminal through the, our digital crimes unit, you know, the way we protect the privacy of our customers is we'll work with the bank customer that that is, and you know, together we'll investigate and, and work on the prosecution. Mm -hmm. JF, do you see challenges to sharing information with other banks, to sharing information with law enforcement? I, I think the industry's come a long way. There's some solid organizations like the FSI SAC, the FSR in the United States, which brings together the GSIP banks uh, in partnership with the U.S. government to drive more intelligence sharing. Um, and it also comes back to sharing not just intelligence for prosecution, but sharing best practices, sharing TTPs, so the techniques, the tactics, uh, the procedures that adversaries are using, but also sharing how, we're, how the industry comes together in light of an attack, right? And I think when you look at a lot of the focus that's being placed on resilience now, it's how does the industry come together to be ready to face a major disruption? What would happen if a large bank went down as the result of an attack? How do we as an industry come together to be ready for that? What if our, one of our critical partners goes down? And those information sharing partnerships are as critical in the defense, but also in the respond and recover phases of a cyber attack. We need to know that we can all count on each other in those types of scenarios. Are we prepared, Sir Rob, for that kind of scenario where either a nation state actor or a private criminal enterprise decides that crippling financial services is a great way to bring planet Earth to a halt? Are we, uh, do people think that big in their preparations? I'm not, I'm not sure they do. I think they're beginning to, you know, when I work with the boards and executive teams of many global banks, you know, we be, they're beginning to think about the, the, the idea of, and their words, not mine, a potential catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they were spooked by this non petia incident where it, you know, crippled some of global companies that were involved in managing, you know, enormous parts of our world trade, for example, and some of these companies went 10 days without IT. Now, what's the equivalent 
of a major part of our critical banking infrastructure in the world given 10 days without IT. You know, we're on that level of hypothesis at least. Um, are we ready? I think I'd like to see, as, as uh, JF was saying, I'd like to see more crisis simulation events across the industry. Certainly banks are doing that themselves. I'd like to see more of that. Some of the you know, planning that, of, of us, that you might see in the military sector coming into this area. I see, see some good steps, but I think we need to up our game a bit. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the technology that we can use to up that game. Um, Sean, let's, uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence uh, yeah. as an example. We hear a lot about AI. Everyone knows it's coming. No one really knows exactly what it is. Um, but we can imagine that there are opportunities to increase the effectiveness of our, uh, our, our cybercrime prevention tools with the use of AI to detect intrusions, to address them. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what Microsoft's doing in the world of AI to bring those financial services tools out? Yeah, we're actually working on both sides with AI and machine learning, and there is a difference between that one, so they're going to hear right. it. Walk but, us through what, what we yeah. need to know so, about both. And I suppose, I suppose the, everyone who thinks AI, they're thinking Skynet or like um, Robbie the Robot or something like that, and the reality is it's, it's not. It's machine learning algorithms that are able to to learn from experience and maybe respond. And, and I think it's prevalent across all of cybersecurity industry now. It's, it's one of the things that's happened without people knowing. So all the threat technology that we have in, in Microsoft has machine learning AI built into it. So going back to that phishing example of how do we detect phishing, it's really hard. It's really using that machine learning to at speed detect that this is a phishing attack and block mm -hmm. it. Things that we couldn't, if you were to do that with a standard response method, by the time you've responded to it, it's gone. So mm -hmm. some of, particularly of the banking, phishing attacks and malware, they take three minutes. It's a three minute run and it's done. And actually using the machine learning, we're able to detect that's happening and block it within seconds. So effectively reducing that impact on the organization. And, and that goes across the environment into things like defending against malware, against mm -hmm. threats, trying to come into the system. Basically, so historically, when people thought about doing anti-malware, everyone thought it was about a signature which recognizes what a bit of malware looks like and responds to it. And the principle of, of that was that the first 10 people got infected, then the next 10,000 were protected. But the reality now is it changes so quickly, you're talking five, 10 machines per different type. So it's really using machine learning and AI to detect this is an attack. It's going back to the... The, I love the art algorithm um, analogy because I've historically used serial killer, so I think I'm going to swap to using the art, the idea of detecting that this is a tactic, tactic, a technique, or a process that might actually show that there's something malicious happening here, and then stepping in and blocking it and giving the investigator time to respond. Because the challenge we have is is a real skill challenge of how we've got enough people to be able to not just the skill but a people challenge to respond to it and respond to it at the speed we need so it's really using machine learning to step in take that first step automate the response and then allowing the human beings to focus on the more intelligence led the more sophisticated investigation that needs to happen it's not replacing the human being it's augmenting them with the machine learning so anything that's a basic routine task that involves recognizing a process, we, we use a machine to do it. And then as we go into things like building cloud services and AI machine learning, there's a lot of that actually in some of the sort of fraud detection processes that people do in terms of building banking systems. And then, so there's two sides of it. How do we use machine learning to protect the cloud, but also how do we protect the machine learning and AI in the sort of systems that people are doing? So as people start to use AI and machine learning, we're already seeing the bad guys trying to gain that, both when we try to use it to stop malware, but also when people are trying to use it to predict a mortgage statement or how we're going to do elements, people are trying to gain that process. So really using machine learning as well to detect that attempt to gain. So it's both sides. It's looking at the traditional threat actors and malware, but also using it to, to look at fraud, to look at attempts to exploit as people use machine learning and AI. It's really uh, at its early stages, but it's, it's prevalent across the whole cybersecurity industry. It's built into all of Microsoft's capabilities, but also you know, many of the other cybersecurity vendors out there will be using machine learning today as well. JF, what are you excited to, to deploy uh, on JPMorgan Chase's behalf within the machine learning AI uh, 
stuff that we're, uh, we're anticipating will be on the market soon. So spot on with what you were saying, right? It's how do you free up resources? Like my, my biggest challenge is how do I do more with the resources that I have today? And one, one of the, my, my team came to me one day and we, we have a, a system where when you get a suspicious email that hasn't been blocked by our layered controls, they right click on it and it says report suspicious. It would come to my team and, and lo and behold, it was three headcount that spent their time just reviewing those reports. Well, with machine learning, what we were able to do is a few very, very simple things. We realized that people, through awareness, and, and sometimes you do too good of a job of awareness, the minute they were getting something that looked a little wrong, they would right-click and report suspicious to hear from us and tell them, yeah, it's okay, you can click on that. And we've automated part of that, so we recognize spam and we tell people this is spam. You know, you can do whatever you want with it, you can delete it. And then, do we already know about this? So we have, you know, repositories of data where we store what we call indicators of compromise. Bad IP addresses, URLs, email addresses, all this information tied to threat actors, and then we can go, oh, we've gotten this phishing email, it matches the numbers of these indicators, it's potentially associated with this adversary, we're concerned about this adversary, send it to an analyst for review. Or, oh, this is something we've never seen before. So our analysts now, instead of processing a queue, are focused on doing in-depth analysis of that data that we're receiving instead of just processing large volumes of cases. It's a simple use case, but it's really changed the way the team operates, and it gives us way more visibility into adversary activity. And it's also a question of partnering with our teams that are rolling out machine learning and AI to talk about, you know, we talk about the SDLC, the software development life cycle. Well, there's a model development life cycle and ensuring that the appropriate controls exist throughout the development of these machine learning models, these AI models, to ensure that they cannot be manipulated by an adversary. Sure. I, I would just echo uh, the, same, the same comments around the need for more automation to free up resources to focus on some of the real higher level risks and intelligence investigation and analysis. I think one of the things I'm pretty excited about that I'm starting to see really proliferate in the marketplace though is around instrumentation because that has really been the tough nut to crack uh, as far as having the visibility across our organizations in an automated way that's using intelligence and ma machine learning to understand where our controls are operating effectively versus not. I mean, we all operate in very complex, multinational, global organizations with, you know, hundreds of thousands of, 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 of employees, and how do we ensure that we've got that right visibility? And so there's some great new technologies, I think, that are coming onto the market around instrumentation that really will give us that insight and give us the business risk intelligence, not solely the threat intelligence, which has been the thing that I think we've relied on mostly in our field in the past, but now the, the metrication, if you will, of, of, of real time risk insights around cybersecurity, and I think that's the next big wave that we're gonna see in our field. And this, and this kind of tech is also powering the cops, actually. Um, you know, using machine learning to identify criminal conspiracies in an earlier stage, and even identify the criminals themselves. So, you know, when you, when you aggregate data and you, you use machine learning in combination with data analytics, for example, then you can identify non-obvious connections by, uh, between a cyber criminal in Ukraine, a fraudster in Germany perhaps, uh, and a money launderer somewhere uh, in France. Uh, and I use those three examples of crime deliberately, by the way, Jason, because what we are, have been seeing in the last few years is indeed the convergence of cyber fraud and money launderers, that this, the cyber criminal economy is converging, uh, more sophisticated, interconnected criminal syndicates that are using cyber to generate large-scale of frauds, and then the same people laundering the process of that back through the banking network. Machine learning is helping us to identify those trends. Really important strategic learning lesson, because when you throw that back into the industry, you see that each global bank is still largely separating the way in which they manage cyber fraud and money laundering. Separate hierarchies, governance, 
separate data streams. And we're missing the opportunity, therefore, to join the dots of what is behind the curtain a much more integrated criminal economy. So a really positive example of how tech can help us to improve our controls, even on a sort of strategic level. Is that because institutions are not thinking about um, those uh, work streams together because historically they haven't been, you know, the fraud side has been worried about check kiters or, you know, people forging things or somebody taking too much out of their ATM, you know, the little, the little stuff, and they're not thinking about the, the, the big picture. Is that why they're, they're yeah. separated? Out? I do think there's, there's an absence of some sort of big picture thinking here. We've always done it this way, haven't we? Um, I think, to be fair to the banks, the regulatory differences between running large anti-money laundering regimes to what's happening in cyber is different. Data types are different, the people are different. But I think there's a real opportunity in the industry to reflect better the kind of adversaries that are, that are running at, at our risk controls. Uh, and by the way, to do, to do it in a way that's going to develop fantastic efficiencies, economies of scale. So I think that's a noticeable trend in, in, the, in, in the industry that, that um, I think we can, we can, we can use a bit more in, in, in the next couple of years. I want to ask our panel as a, as a way to close this out to uh, each uh, give the audience uh, one thing to think about, uh, whether it's something to explore while here at Cybos and looking at all the great technology displays on the, on the show floor, or some cyber security activity that maybe people aren't thinking about that they should be thinking about. Just uh, one kind of key takeaway that each of you would, would give the audience something to think about, something to, to uh, take back to the home office, if you will, um, to, uh, to better position themselves to, to address these threats of the future. So Rob, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I'm just gonna stay on that point, actually. I think the, the one thing is that we've gotta use data in a smarter way. Uh, we, we are processing in the banking environment so much potentially rich data. We actually understand a lot more than we think we do across those different domains. If only we could aggregate it, analyze it, use the power of AI, um, use the power of information sharing platforms in a better way. So think about the, your, your control frameworks across those disciplines of money laundering, fraud, and cyber. Try to create an intelligence brain at the heart of your of your business, um, you know, that's using threat intelligence in a better way, as you're hearing from JF and Sherry. Data-powered response to dealing with the complexity of cybercrime, I think, is the future here. Sean, one key cybersecurity takeaway, something to implement, something to maybe think about. I'm sort of tempted to say, don't use your dog's name as a password, but I won't uh, go away. Okay. Yeah, so, we got that one. You need a yeah. second one. Um, <laughs> so I think the reality is that I think it's going back to what Sherry was saying, that cyber risk is just another risk. So too often it gets put in a special bucket and treated as the ugly baby in the corner. Actually think of it as part of what you're trying to do when you're doing any new change to the organization. And then as part of that, then the security team are there to help you to happen it and be effectively enabled to the business. Don't think of it as scary, it's just a, another factor of doing business in the modern world. Great point. JF, what's your takeaway? Partnership, right? Really changing the mindset in cybersecurity organizations that we're there to enable the business. We're there to work with the business. It's no longer about saying no, it's about saying how, right? So how do we build out the appropriate controls to enable change, to enable innovation, but also how do you have partners in cybersecurity that understand the business? I have people that sit with our banking teams, our operation centers for wholesale payments, so that we have people that are dedicated to understanding what they do, and they can actually take the intelligence, enrich it to make it valuable to the business, and really make the conversation about business risk, not a conversation about you know, cyber people doing cyber things. It's really about the, the, the cyber component of the business risk. Sure. It's always toughest to go last, right, uh, in the wrap up. But, uh, of course, approaching cyber as a, as a business risk, uh, number one. But maybe the, the item that I would, would leave as a question to ask as you're walking the floor at Cybos and you're looking at cool new technologies and different methods for delivering uh, banking and financial services, is are you asking while you're hearing the great pitch about all those really cool new features, are you also asking, how secure is your particular feature and your particular offering? 
That's a key question. Security first, uh, it's an important question to ask. And, and I think another uh, key takeaway from this discussion is, um, as we talk about the intersection of regulation, financial services, and technology, that we shouldn't let uh, any of those be a bar to the important work uh, of protecting customers. Um, when I think as a consumer about one of the most important fraud prevention tools that I have available to me as a consumer using a card, is that uh, if I'm using my Chase card, my Chase Visa, um, in Budapest, uh, and um, Visa knows that my phone is in New York City because I've given them permission to use my phone's location, uh, that's probably a fraudulent transaction that I'm not actually in Budapest and New York at the same time. Now, there are privacy concerns with the location question there. But imagine the fraud prevention capabilities that we can enable by addressing those privacy concerns and still deploying those tools. And that, I think, is the most important takeaway from this conversation today, that there are opportunities for partnership between financial services companies, technology companies, and enablers that help us put it all together. Um, and uh, I think we all uh, owe a great debt of gratitude to our friends at SWIFT and Cybos for putting together this conversation. Um, and I encourage you all, as you're walking the show floor, um, to ask those important questions about the capabilities, about the technology, and about the security that uh, is enabled um, by the next generation of these great innovations. So I'd ask you all to please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific discussion.